So now let's start building out a little bit more of our listing service. Uh, and what we're actually going to do first is have a look at this database over here. So we've got MySQL root password equals password, uh, database equals DB, but we haven't actually exposed this to the outside world. So we can't access it on our uh, actual computer. So what we can do here is let's just add in here ports and let's do 0 .0 .0 .0 0 0.0.0.0 and let's do 7200. 3306. So the reason I do this is because I'm going to use 7200 uh, for this DB and for the other DB it's going to be 7201. So essentially what I'm going for is like my application will be at 7001, uh, my API gateway will be at 7000 uh, and these ones here we're going to just publicly expose for now. Uh, our databases will be at 720 something uh, and our services will be at 710 something uh, but I'll show that later. So we have this database here and let's also do this one and let's do 720. One. So we have these two here, we do a control C and just let that kill and then let's docker compose up again and it will recreate that. So in the meantime, I'm going to get SQL Pro open and you'll notice I have SQL Pro over here. Uh, we've got users service DB and also listings service DB. So let's have a look inside of listing service DB here. Uh, let's click connect and uh, go down here to DB and our database should be empty. Uh, in terms of the actual uh, configuration, uh, the host, we can just do 127001, which is basically local host. Uh, our username is going to be root and our password is just password. Uh, obviously it doesn't show here, but P-A-S-S-W-O-R-D because that's what we specified here. So that's the root password. Uh, for the database, it's optional, but you can write DB here if you want. Uh, for listing service DB, it's 7200 for the port. And for user service DB, it's 7201. So now inside of listing service DB, you'll notice that it's completely empty, uh, which makes sense. Uh, we're going to add some stuff into this now. So let's keep this one running up here. Uh, let's create a new terminal window and let's go inside of listing service. So let's go into here and let's add in yarn add MySQL2 sqlize and also sqlize cli so we'll be using sqlize to kind of handle database stuff uh, for the sake of this project sqlize is my personal favorite when it comes to orms i find that it's the one that works most consistently for me uh, and the one that i run into the least issues with so that's the one i'm going to use uh, we need sqlize cli to in order to run like migrations and you'll see uh, what we do with that uh, mysql2 is specifically so that we can interact with mysql databases so now that we have that out of the way uh, inside of listing service here Let's uh, right click and create a new file and we'll call this one .sqlize rc. So this will be our sqlize configuration file. And inside of this file here, just write const path is equal to require path like that. And we're going to do module.export is equal to config path.resolve underscore underscore dir name like that dot slash sqlize slash config dot js. So let me just make this one a little bit smaller so we can have that on one line. Let's put a comma at the end and do migrations path and then do path.resolve underscore underscore dir name dot slash sqlize forward slash migrations like that. So now we can uh, put a semicolon here, save this file. Let's uh, put it into JavaScript so we can see uh, what it looks like. Uh, and that's perfect right there. So now this file here uh, is going to be our configuration for sqlize. And with this file out of the way, you'll notice that we have a sqlize directory that we're specifying here. So we're going to right click this new file and we're going to create this. So sqlize forward slash config.js and this one goes outside the src directory and inside of this file here just write in module.exports.development is equal to and then dialect is going to be mysql uh, cda storage is going to be a sqlize although we won't really be using this and then url is going to be process.env dot db underscore uri. So we're going to save this here and you'll notice that we're using process.m dot db uri. So we actually haven't defined this. Um, and in order to define this, let's go into docker compose .yaml here. And for listing service here, uh, underneath depends on, we're going to do uh, environment here and let's do uh, hyphen db uri is equal to, and we're going to write mysql colon forward slash forward slash root colon password at listings service db forward slash db question mark char set is equal to utf8 so let me explain what's going on here so mysql is the database management system that we're using uh, root is the username password is the password and it's going to be at uh at listings service db. So listing service db is actually this database here. So inside of Docker, it does this thing, which is really cool, which is it lets you access other containers inside of Docker Compose simply by writing their name. So by doing at listing service db, it will automatically uh, refer to this one, uh, regardless of the actual IP address, which is assigned to it. So we can do that, which is pretty cool. And then we have forward slash uh, the database name, which is going to be db. Notice how that matches this one here. And then we do question mark the char set, which is essentially the 
encoding, we set to UCF8. So that's something that I always use um, and it just works well uh, in terms of Chinese characters, in terms of emojis. So as to whether or not it actually does anything in this context, I'm not 100% sure, but I think that it's good to have that there. So now we have our environment thing set up here. Uh, let's uh, grab this one and let's actually put it here for a user's service as well. It's pretty much the same thing, except this one becomes users service DB. Uh, the username and password stay the same. Uh, so we use that one there. So now we've got DB URI defined. Uh, let's go back into SQLize here and let's create a directory called migrations. So this is where we will store all of our migrations for this project. Essentially what migrations are is they represent uh, the kind of changes to the tables uh, and to the database structure that we're going to do incrementally throughout our project. So the first one we're going to do here is right click new file and we're going to create a file based upon uh, the current date and time. So what I like to do is like the first leave the year, so 2019 and then the month, which is uh, December at the moment, and then today's the 22nd. Uh, and then for the time, we're going to do 3.04.51 p.m. So 1.50451. And then we're going to do hyphen create, and we're going to call this one listings.js. So listings is the name of our table, which is why we do create listings, because we're going to create that table now. So inside of here, we're going to write module.exports dot up is equal to query interface and data types like that and do return query interface dot create table and we're going to write listings here and then curly braces id and this one's going to be uh, allow null false auto increment is true if i can spell that correctly uh, primary key is going to be true and the type is data types dot integer dot unsigned so this is our id here and we're going to write title is allow null false type is data types dot string question uh, comma again uh, and then description and then allow null is false and the type is data types dot text so this is how we kind of uh, store the title and the description are the two main uh, data types we're going to be storing here and then comma and then created at and this one's going to be allow null false type is data types dot date. So uh, if you've watched my video on um, SQLize before in the past, you'll know that these are the kind of SQLize timestamps. So we have created at, we have updated at, and we also have deleted at. The only difference is that deleted at is allow null true. So now curly brace here, curly brace there, put a comma, curly brace again, and we're going to write char set, and this one is going to be UTF-8 like that. So the char set essentially represents uh, the character encoding for this table. So it's actually quite important that we set it to this, otherwise we can't include cool stuff like emojis, because that just kind of breaks the whole thing. So we have this here, we have create listings, and now what we're going to do is go into package.json, and let's try and figure out a way to actually get this migration run on the table. So the way that we do that is we add in a script. So scripts here, we're going to write db migrate and we're gonna do sqlize db colon migrate like that. We're also going to do one more, which is going to be db migrate undo. And this one's going to do sqlize db migrate undo. So essentially migrate will run all of the migrations that haven't been run yet. And db migrate undo will undo the last migration that we did. So these two are really quite useful. We include them here. And now what we're actually going to do is we're going to open up a terminal here and we're going to do docker ps. So docker ps basically tells us uh, which ones are currently running. Uh, we can actually open up a uh, bigger terminal here so we can see that more clearly. So let's go here and let's just do uh, docker ps. And you'll notice that we have uh, the user servers, uh, the listing servers, and then we have two MySQL ones, uh, these ones here. So what we're going to do is we're going to go into the listing service one. And the best way to do that is to just use the container ID. So what we're going to write here is docker exec hyphen IT. IT stands for interactive terminal, and we're going to grab the container ID. I'm pretty sure in this case here, because all four of these have different starting characters, we can just write C1 and it will automatically match. And then we just write bash after that. So now you'll see that we're inside this one here. It's successfully matched up because there's only one starting with C1 uh, and we're inside forward slash opt forward slash app. So if we do LS here, you'll notice that we actually have all of the files for our uh, listing service. And the reason for that is because forward slash opt slash app is a mounted volume. Uh, we covered this inside the Docker compose file. So now inside of here, we're going to do yarn db colon migrate and we're going to wait for that to run. And we actually get an error. And the reason we get an error here is because I haven't restarted uh, my Docker Compose. And that's completely my fault because we added in these environment variables, this one here and that one there, but we haven't uh, restarted it to kind of uh, enforce those. So we're going to control C this one here real quick and we're going to uh, rerun it. This one will uh, get refused as well. Or oh, actually it should disconnect. 
but um, we'll wait for that to happen. Yep, so now it seems to be running. Uh, let's go over here and this one's closed on us. So let's reopen this one and do Docker PS. Let's see which one it is. It should be 7C. So let's change this one here to 7C and then bash. Now we're inside again. Uh, let's make sure it's working. So we do yarn db migrate. And now you see that it did create listings, migrating, migrated. So now let's actually go over back into SQL Pro. Uh, and if we refresh this one here, you'll notice that we now have a listings table exactly as we wanted it to be created. So now quickly before I move on, I want to kind of discuss something here, which is inside of Docker Compose, we have uh, a listing service, a listing service DB, a user service and a user's service DB. So now one thing to note about microservices in general is that the reason that you use microservices is to get around the issue of load balancing. So basically when you have all of your code inside of a single service or a single server, um, there may be certain endpoints which are used quite more often than others. For example, let's just say with Netflix, you're far more often going to be streaming video than you are going to be paying for a subscription plan or something like that. So in other words, Netflix needs a much higher bandwidth for its video streaming than for its subscription service or like in other words, signing up or payment or whatever. So what that means is that if it has all of it inside of a single process, then we'd have to um, double that process, triple that uh, to suit whatever's being used the most. And that is actually really inefficient in terms of resource. Uh, so what Netflix actually does um, as a famous example of microservices is it splits it up into these so-called microservices, which essentially run independently of each other. And then when you need data to be kind of sent between different microservices, they all kind of communicate that way. Uh, so what we're doing here is in our case, it's a lot simpler than what Netflix does, obviously. Uh, but we have uh, two databases here, uh, one to store the listings, one to store the users uh, here. And we also have two services. So we have a listing service and a user service. So ours in terms of microservices is a very small uh, setup here. And um, it's also incredibly simple because we only have one instance of listing service running, one instance of user service, one instance of each database. And what that means is that it keeps all of it relatively minimal. However, in a thing like Netflix, you might have, say for example, a hundred instances uh, of streaming services up at the same time, if not more. So they need to have that in order to handle the amount of bandwidth that they serve uh, consistently. So then they have to deal with issues surrounding concurrency. They have to deal with issues surrounding a database reads and writes. They have to deal with things like eventual consistency. Uh, they have to deal with a whole lot of stuff, including like fault tolerance and all that kind of stuff. Um, all of that is incredibly important, but it's not in the scope of this video. And the reason I chose not to cover it is because it's not strictly necessary to an understanding of microservices as a concept and to showcasing your ability to use it. It's also incredibly hard for me to kind of show you how that works within any given context, because the way Netflix does it is incredibly different to the way some other company would do it. Uh, and also it's just incredibly powered by the needs of the business. So this is not something that you can kind of cover all in a single video. However, there are great resources out there which kind of explain all of these concepts in a lot more detail in terms of uh, also like blue green deployments, uh, you know, like obviously continuous integration and how to deploy, how to make sure you maintain uptime uh, between services, all that kind of stuff. So that's definitely worth having a look at uh, in addition to the content within this video. But yeah, anyway, let's move on. So we've got user service over here and we're going to essentially do something very similar for this. So let's grab SQLize RC and let's put it down here as well. So we have that file there and we have a SQLize directory that we're going to paste over as well. So we have SQLize RC and we have SQLize. Uh, we're also going to go into user service here and we're going to add in yarn add MySQL to SQLize SQLize CLI. So basically the same dependencies as what we just did. Uh, we're just going to add them back in here as well. So these two are two, you can think of them as two completely separate services. As such, you know, you won't have any kind of like dependencies automatically being stored for both. You have to consider them as separate rather than the same thing, which is also why they both have separate databases. Because if at the end of the day, they have one database, then you're not really getting around the issue that microservices exist to try and solve, which is that uh, usually the database is the one that suffers the most uh, in these circumstances. So it's usually the one to kind of uh, break the most often under pressure. So that's the thing that we have to kind of try and optimize here. So that's why we use two databases. Um, and that's what we're doing here. So anyways, we have our dependencies installed. Let's go inside package JSON and copy over these two scripts here as well. So we're going to need those. Uh, we got SQLize migrations and we have this one here. Uh, let's actually just modify that. So the current time is uh, 12221515. Uh, and this one is just going to be 09. 
So once again, 2019-12, uh, December 22nd, uh, 3 p.m., 3.15 p.m. and 9 seconds. So this one is going to be uh, create and we're going to create users. .js like that. And inside of here, instead of listings, we're obviously going to write users. Uh, we have ID up here, uh, allow null is false. And then auto increment, we're gonna get rid of this. Keep primary key is true, but we're going to change the data types to UUID. So we're going to use UUIDs for the users. Um, it's just generally a security thing. I guess the best argument is that when you use natural numbers like one, two, three, four, five, uh, you can kind of tell how many users there are and uh, whether there were users before or after something like that. So it's just generally not a great idea, but really it doesn't matter too much, but that's what I'm gonna do here. We're also going to use uh, email and we're going to make this one uh, unique. So basically you can only have uh, one email address, so you can't reuse an email. Uh, and this one here is going to be password hash allow null is false and data types dot char 64. So this is a, a big crypt hash, which we're going to be using later. I'm going to show you how to set that up. We have created that, updated that and deleted that as well. So everything else here is the same. We have users and let's add one more here. 20191222, uh, 151633. And this one's going to be create user sessions dot JS. So this is a second file uh, and it goes underneath the first one because of the timestamp. And inside of here, we're just going to copy this one paste it over here, uh, change this one here to user sessions. And then we have an ID, allow null false, primary key true. We're going to keep the UUID here for the session as well. Uh, definitely a good idea for a session. And we're going to have user ID, uh, allow null is false. And this one's going to reference uh, the ID uh, column inside of uh, the users table. And we're going to write type is also data types .uuid. So when you reference another column in a foreign key like this, it has to match exactly. For example, allow null false a data types uuid has to match allow null false data types uuid. You don't want to write primary key. You just want to match uh, whether or not it's null and also the type. So those are the two we're matching here. Uh, and then underneath here, we're going to do expires at allow null is going to be false. And type is data types .date. And we're also going to do create it at, uh, create it at allow null false data types dot date like that. So now that we have these two, we don't need update to that and we don't need delete to that there. So we can save it like this. Now we have module exports up in both. I actually forgot to include the down. So the down is going to be module exports dot down is equal to query interface like that. And then query interface dot drop table. And we're going to write user sessions like so. And Actually, this one's getting kind of stuffy. So let me do this. Uh, we have module exports down query interface dot drop table like that. And we're going to write the same line inside of the other file. Uh, this one here is going to be users, my bad. So users to match users and uh, user sessions to match user sessions here. So now that we have these two, let's go back into our big terminal window. Let's control D to exit that. Uh, and let's this time uh, first do Docker PS. So have a look and we have a uh, this one is CB. So we can just even try C, honestly, because uh, the first character is uniquely C out of these four. So that should let us in. And then we can do yarn DB migrate, and this should create two tables for us inside of there. So now we have users and user sessions, but you'll notice that they don't actually appear inside the same one for listings because the one for listings uh, is obviously a different database. So now let's go to new tab again. And this time let's choose users service DB, click connect and now choose DB and you'll notice that we have users and we have user sessions.